start now. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome to, uh, to today's event on de facto and de jure apartheid in South Africa. Uh, very happy to have you. Uh, I feel like we've actually, with a bunch of warm bodies in this closed space, transported ourselves climatologically to South Africa for a few hours. Uh, but we're going to go there uh, intellectually, historically, politically in a moment with, uh, with our distinguished mini panel of speakers, Yasser Henry and Heidi Grunbaum. Uh, I'm John Chorchari. I'm a professor at the Ford School, and I also am an affiliate of a couple of the centers and initiatives here at the International Institute. Um, we at the International Policy Center are grateful for uh, the support from the African Studies Center here in the International Institute, as well as our Center for Public Policy and Diverse Societies and the Dean's Office for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, we're very lucky to have two people who are extremely experienced both as scholars and as advocates uh, for uh, reconciliation and justice in South Africa. We're also especially privileged that they have a long experience of working together and the discussion that we're about to participate in is one that's been going as the subtitle for today's event suggests for a couple of decades now. Um, as the country uh, continues along its arduous path toward reconciliation, uh, intellectual and uh, leaders and advocates such as Yasir and Heidi have been at the forefront of that, and they're going to share some of their insights and experiences with us today. Let me introduce them really briefly. Heidi is a scholar and a writer. She's a senior researcher at the Center for the Humanities Research uh, at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. Uh, her work uh, focuses on aesthetic and social responses to the afterlives of war and Mass, mass atrocities or violence, politics of memory and memorialization, uh, and also the uh, geographies of displacement of South Africa, Germany, and more recently Israel, Palestine. Uh, she's the author of Memorializing the Past, a 2011 book about everyday life in South Africa after the TRC. Uh, she's also been involved in a number of other academic projects. And some of you had the, the pleasure uh, and privilege of seeing uh, the film that she did with Mark Kaplan yesterday. Uh, that's entitled The Village Under the Forest. If you weren't able to, uh, to make it yesterday, I really highly recommend it to you. Uh, and I believe you said it's available now on iTunes, and so people can, can look for this uh, after the event. It's, uh, it's going to touch on some of the same themes and also draw connections between today's discussion uh, and another of the you know, sort of difficult processes of, of reconciliation that's underway uh, in, in the Near East. Uh, Yasser Henry is, is my friend and colleague from the Ford School who teaches there. He's a scholar, a writer, a strategist, and also a professional human rights advocate. Uh, Yasser has written and published on the political economy of, of social voice, memory, trauma, identity, peace processes, and transitional justice. Um, his current research and writing are focused on how structural and administrative violence uh, come to be institutionalized during uh, post-colonial transitions. And so you can hear both from the title of Heidi's book that I mentioned and Yasir's current project, both of them are working as intellectuals on the exact themes that we're going to be discussing today. He's got in-depth experience, Yasir, in social and political movements. In fact, that's what he's got as a, a very personal connection to these issues as well as a, a professional intellectual one, uh, as well as a lot of experience in political strategy and conflict management. So what I've asked uh, our our panelists to do is to start off by each helping to frame our conversation, speaking for uh, about uh, 10 minutes apiece. I'm then going to pose a couple of questions to sort of feed into a conversation and dialogue between the two of them. And then I hope that as we go along, you'll feed in with comments and questions so that we make this as, as conversational and, 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 and informal as possible. So let's all first thank Heidi and Yasir, and then we'll ask them to start with the Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming in this beautifully warm winter uh, January day in Ann Arbor, my favorite place to spend my time during the winter, uh, especially when it's like this. Uh, doesn't mean I'm not aware of what El Nino is doing to other parts of the world, just I'm not very saddened by the fact that it's, you know, I can walk around without wearing five layers of down. <laughs> um, and this is a dedication to those of you that came from my 717 class. I'm going to use this technology today because I talk too much usually. But... Oh my God. <laughs> 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 
maybe not. <laughs> So I want to, to dedicate um, this panel and talk to the mothers uh, and the families of those who lost their children during the anti-apartheid war. And too many of them today continue to live the consequences not only of apartheid, but the defense of apartheid locally as well as globally, uh, and remain extremely vulnerable today as we speak. The title of my talk is Apartheid South Africa, a Crime Which Endures, and the framing, of course, is in the title that you have before you. I was born in South Africa at the time. It had become infamous, uh, both in South Africa and the rest of the world, not only because it actively created and enacted, and also defended violently the system that which came to be known as Apartheid, but also because there were so many who actually thought it was a good thing. At the same time, this word apartheid was associated with a growing movement globally inside South Africa as well as uh, elsewhere for the stand taken by many people to end it, oftentimes at great risk to themselves and their families. M making a legal and political distinction between the material realities produced by different forms of political and social apartheid uh, as practice is a very important one to make intellectually. Such conceptual understandings of human rights travesties are crucial for mediating and also coming to terms with a global moral responsibility to engage oppression and the human devastation which such oppression, oppressive systems cause. Especially for those of us who consider ourselves global citizens and who care also for humanity. Such oppressive systems should affront all of humanity. This is, seems obvious. But as, we, as many of us know, it is not always so. In order to fight such crimes, understanding that such systems are created also as systems of benefit and systems of loss in the socio-structural and the meta-ethical spheres of our everyday life is important. The discourse and discourses which justify and allow for legal, social, economic, and political damage to be perpetuated and lived as normality has to be apprehended. Documents which form the basis for global moral ideals, sometimes not only and not always curated by the United Nations organization, are too often read as useless documents because the material realities of the present seems always as at, at, at odds with the human and moral ideals experienced by those of us engaged in human rights advocacy and too oftentimes argued as future impossibilities. The system of apartheid in South Africa was labeled a crime against humanity by the United Nations Organization General Assembly on the 16th of December 1966, which was endorsed by the United Nations Security Council in 1984, and in November 1973, the General Assembly adopted the Apartheid Convention, declaring, and this is very important for those of us who live in South Africa, as well as those of us who live in the US, declaring systematic oppression of groups and persons, groups of persons, as an international crime. I have many pages here. I printed them in 14 font so that I can read because I lost my specs. Um, so don't think I'm going to be speaking for too long. Um, and I know I'm very serious. I wanted to break that seriousness uh, a little bit as part of my news resolution. <laughs> the South African state 
This political failure to adhere to the moral precepts contained not only in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights after 1948, but also in the Charter of the United Nations in 1945, I will argue and have, uh, has, have argued is central to causing the civil conflict in South Africa, which endured formally and legally until 1994 and continues to endure socially today. Despite, you know, uh, for nearly 15 years, there being a global acceptance that apartheid as a crime has been settled. It has not been settled. Negotiations, <coughs> political settlements, and peacemaking during war always exist within very complex interplays of politics, of law, and of morality. Such in inherent and intersecting relations of power include the persistence of structures of dominance related to the initiating instance of violence. And these should be regarded as pivotal in understanding how the context of political transition, how the context of resistance to oppression textures, the nature of conflict, as well as the nature of conflict management and the nature of settlement. Colonial settlements, especially in Anglophone, Africa, but not only, have almost always included a moral paradox, seamed into the peacemaking process and into human rights settlement questions. This moral, this moral paradox is crucial to understanding the political and legal settlement of conflict, but it does not necessarily, and for me this is important, it does, it does not necessarily lead to longer term social and economic settlement. So important in terms of social and economic rights. In constructing and manufacturing the idea of a sustainable and a longer term peace of the war. So initial settlements as ongoing social dialogues need to be constantly managed in policy frames, legally, as well as in society as a whole. The role of transitional justice mechanisms such as truth commissions and acts of official public apologies are important in shaping reparative narratives which follow some national settlements of the conflict and civil strife, but unfortunately, and I don't mean to be, just be the harbinger of doom, but I think it's important to understand this conceptually, they do not settle all the questions central to the conflict, nor to broader moral ideas and ideals of human rights. Such questions and challenges remain a part of the democratic state's quest for, for greater social cohesion after conflict. Such historical dialogic processes may continue unofficially long after, the con long after constitutional democracies have been inaugurated. They do not provide for human rights settlement miraculously, neither, and just as wars do not just occur out of the ether. The consequences of systems like apartheid, whether de jure or de facto, all find their genesis in the law. Here I speak of the law as a constituting and a constitutive law. The law, in this sense, is political and it is historically and it is morally constructed. It is not natural. It is administered by states and it is, it is administrative. And it is lived through complex governmental procedures and policies. In complex societies, legal and political professionals create and mediate the law as the concept of law has a responsibility to regulate the peace based on the moral precepts inherent to the constitution of the law, now universally applicable, regardless of individuated, organizational, or institutional opinion. Therefore, the law, as well as those who curate the law, are responsible to the lived and material conditions which such consequences produce, feeling, thinking, and speaking human rights ideals as a responsibility to the public domain beyond the moral, social, and political paralysis sometimes experienced both intracyclically 
as well as exercised largely in the social political body or generally uh, social political psyche of the collective body of a people, of the people, of a global people. Article 56 and Article 50, 55 read very easily, but they relate to the softer elements of politics, law, and morality. And this is Articles of the Charter of the United Nations. Article 55, with a view to the creation of the conditions of stability and well-being, which are necessary for peaceful and friendly relations amongst, nation, amongst nations based on respect for the <coughs> principle of equal rights and self-determination of people, <coughs> the United Nations shall promote higher standards of living, full employment and the conditions of economic and social progress and development. Section B, Article 55, solutions to international economic, social, health and related problems and international cultural and educational cooperation and the universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language or religion. Article 56 says, all members pledge themselves to take joint separate action in cooperation with the organization for the achievement of the purposes set forth in Article 55. Therefore, the public representation of witnessing, of recovery, and of testimony after administrative, legal, historical, and political violence, as I said before, always exists within certain socio-cultural, structural, economic, and interpretive, as well as narrative settings. The production of the official voice during systematic processes claiming to settle all human rights questions is thus imbued with such inherent in and intersecting relations of power, which mediate all such claims an important, sec an important secondary part to the actual settlement process are always and are the ways in which violence during conflict, along with the experience of human rights abuses and atrocities, come to be publicly represented, accepted, and accepted by the multiple parties previously involved in the war. Now, the legacy and lived as the legacy of war. Those able and, ca and capable to articulate themselves systemically, voice in the political body politic of society and voicing are articulated legally, officially, and publicly. And if this is so, then silence, especially social, legal, and political silence, as well as the process of silencing the experience and the articulation of vulnerability in the context of social violence, is not innocent. These consequences are lived as experience in society, local, national, uh, and as part of the global public experience. A complex and simultaneous experience that has a context of loss, of benefit, of perpetration, of victimhood, and is thus made possible by those of us who stand by as if we are not also beneficiaries. And here I speak of myself as a global citizen. And therefore, it's important for me to distinguish first between the first and the second and the third order of beneficiary and perpetration group experience, because these allow <coughs> actors who are engaging in the discourse of domination and human rights to address this idea of a psychic impossibility as a cure to the ills of society, to the ills of war, and to the ills of violence. Silencing this possibility, this idea, this willingness to self-articulate as individuals and as groups, I'm arguing here is the ideal of both imperialistic practice as well as imperialistic discourse. Which time do uh, It starts with a negative, so we should go. <laughs> maybe a few more minutes. Okay. I'm nearly done. So the questions, and you have these questions before you, is the official record of human rights violations, abuse, and atrocity enough to ensure systemic and administrative change in accordance with human rights claims before and during settlement processes of the violence and conflict? 
What does it mean to give up that right once the conflict has ended and the peace has just begun? For me, what's important to note, so that I'm not just depressing, Okay, that was supposed to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so, is that official recognition and, and acknowledgement of pain and abuse is crucial to the ending of atrocity, but it is only the beginning of the recovery of the reparative and of the restitutive process. It does not end with a peace settlement. Apartheid systems are administrative. They Therefore, they are also social and political systems and they are constructed ideologically as well as legally. They are not simple aberration, aberrations to human ideals created by bad human apples. It is expedient for people like myself who benefit from such systems to think so. And here, I, like I said, I've included myself and I want to state that categorically. I don't see myself free of the beneficiary classes. For these systems to be engaged effectively, they have to be addressed at every level where they exist, including the post-legal structures which live on as de facto apartheid. Hidden in the case of South Africa, <coughs> as resolved human rights miracle, in the US, for example, as a fantasy of post-racialism. As intellectuals, it is crucial for us to explore and reflect critically on the socio-political, the psychosocial, and the socio-economic inflections contained in the processes, in processes of testifying to pain caused by such systems and which are lived both unofficially and officially in the public domain as normal. So I want to conclude. How are the complex meanings and framings attached to such articulations by multiple communities involved in the South African conflict during apartheid in South Africa as well as in the rest of the world because South Africa was an international crime? It did not only exist on the land, the geospecificity and the geopolitical sphere of the nation called the Republic of South Africa. It was supported, enabled and articulated elsewhere and it has a history deeply rooted in the colonial practice and the theft of our land. Doing so will directly impact this violence, legally, administratively, socially, politically, morally, and economically. So the local and global framing of the dominant, those groups who directly are responsible for perpetrating and defending atrocity, as well as those who benefit from the context of atrocity and the ways in which human rights violations come to be legally and morally framed during and after official process of transitions from atrocity to democracy, now lived as normality. It is not normal, in my opinion, intellectually, both as advocate and as scholar, to live death as social experience, as normality. So it is my opinion that such an, inter such an analysis and theoretical endeavor may contribute to the historical understanding of why specific groups may come, may over time come to feel that the benefits of the peace process do not adequately account for their perceived loss, real and intellectual, long after the transitional process uh, <clears throat> managing what is a crime against humanity has officially ended. And I want to say that this needs and continues to be managed in the policy sphere and in the legal sphere and in the political sphere after the transitional phase so that the, the dream of a democracy, the dream, the possibility of a lived peace may live. Thank you, Yes. Hi everyone, um, just a thank you again to reiterate um, John Chachari, Yasser Henry and Peyaro for um, working so hard and with incredible um, kind of positive energy to 
you know, to invite me here to Michigan. It's, it's a huge honor, um, and I'm very grateful to be here. <coughs> About 20 years ago, Yasser and I began a conversation. Um, it will probably end when um, whatever the whatever's written in the stars for who of us goes <laughs> into our graves first, I think that will be the end of the conversation. Um, and I think maybe that's important, um, is to question the normality of beginnings and ends. Um, so let me start with, um, uh, I suppose, a, something that should have been a beginning, but that was actually an end, um, which began 20 years ago. Uh, it was the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, it's generated a whole industry, scholarly industry, global kind of policy, transitional justice. I mean, it's the, you know, the South African Truth Commission was a major event and events have beginnings and ends, right? So, but it was 20 years ago, uh, in April 2016, the first public hearings of the Human Rights Violations Committee uh, took place in East London, in the Eastern Cape, which is geographically, for those of you who know South Africa, was also the point, the first, one of the first kind of earliest points of, um, of encounter, of engagement, of resistance uh, and of colonial settlement and ongoing uh, wars of resistance. So it wasn't, you know, an accident that it took place in the Eastern Cape, these first <coughs> hearings. And 20 years later, just, you know, there's been a, a counter industry that has basically critiqued the Truth Commission to death. <laughs> and um, 20 years ago, when Yasser and I were having a conversation, we were having a conversation against reconciliation. And I'll try and explain a little how I've understood that. Um, and maybe we can all engage together. I think we've had very different understandings of what against reconciliation means. Um, but just to say that I, as much as I've been, and I think a, a number of us um, in South Africa, on the continent, uh, in other um, in other war contexts have been critical of the Truth Commission um, and of the industry of Truth Commissions. It was a very, uh, it, it, it was a, something noble in that experiment and I want to hold on to the fact that its outcomes weren't written in advance. Um, there have been two dominant narratives about South Africa, both, both within South Africa, but I think it's also one that kind of comes from abroad. It comes from this global discourse on South Africa. And the one is the miracle transition, right, in which <coughs> Nelson Mandela was, you know, never picked up arms, uh, was a nonviolent kind of an icon of nonviolent resistance, and all white people embraced and loved him, um, and he was the key to a peaceful transition, as if there wasn't already a civil war, on the one hand. On the other, there's a story about South Africa that is the kind of failed dream. It's, it's been written. It's got a beginning, a middle, an end. It's got a moral. It's the, it's the post-colonial story of, um, of Africa. And somewhere between that, these two utterly unrealistic, simplistic, reductive, and possibly, you know, for me, insulting versions, um, there lies a much more complex and contradictory reality. And I think the way in which the Truth Commission unfolded um, and got kind of interpreted and packaged and disseminated has contributed to the kind of edifying of these two mutually exclusive and yet completely already married versions of um, the post-apartheid South African story. Um, in the South African scenario, and I, I think this has now become a very normal 
kind of almost commonplace observation in public discourse in South Africa where things are much more contested, much more edgy. It's not so, you know, it's a, it's a much more kind of interesting and difficult space, particularly for, I think, for the beneficiary classes. Um, impunity is not granted anymore <laughs> by the sociality of, um, of South Africa. Um, but it's worth restating, forgiveness was the kind of the go-to term for, as a discursive term, as a moral, as a theological, and as a political term. It, you know, the, the question of forgiveness was very important to the way the Truth Commission was understood. And I'm, my argument has been, and in our conversation has kind of been around what kind of closures did that lead to in terms of a thoroughgoing reckoning and still has you know continues to lead to in terms of a thoroughgoing reckoning with the multiple forms of administrative de dehumanization and in particular its afterlives that settler colonial apartheid produced and because you know, because this kind of fetish, which I don't think was only a South African, a kind of a, a, a construction of um, South African beneficiary classes, this fetish of reconciliation and forgiveness meant that any responses that didn't fit, didn't fit the kind of frame were not admitted. They were delegitimized, especially politically, which has been a great pity because the intellectual and political traditions in South Africa, on the continent, in other places, um, that have been kind of intentionally erased. You know, as scholars now and new generations of younger scholars, more and more, are, are kind of reclaiming those traditions. But the problem with erasure is that you never reclaim anything intact. You, you, find, you find traces and shards. You have to you have to kind of risk reading into the future. You can't kind of put a total, a whole, a complete um, intellectual tradition back together after it's been erased. And I think that work is happening, um, and that is incredibly important and hopeful. But that's hard work, and it takes generations. It's begun. Um, <clears throat> the other kind of rush to impose a language of uh, Forgiveness meant that what should have been a beginning was cast as an end, an end of apartheid, an end of settler coloniality, as a, which, which in a sense formed the very matrix on which apartheid um, was shaped, including its laws. Um, apartheid laws were not a, a kind of invention of, um, of the white supremacists that took power in '48. They grew out of a kind of a global um, colonial and often liberal jurisprudence. So, you know, I think that's just important, even though that's not at all my area um, and I can't talk about law. A, a lot of scholars are making that argument and I think it's an important one in the context of, context of our conversation where you would probably um, have much more to say as uh, would Yasir. And then that, and this brings me to the question of complicity. Um, with the kind of imposition of an official discourse of reconciliation, the spaces narrowed. So there were very clear moral and political roles ascribed to actors, um, to citizens. Uh, perpetrator, victim, um, very early on vocal critics um, of the process, people like Mandani are very important. Uh, interlocutor and intellectual in this conversation um, argued that beneficiaries had been left out and that was you know putting South Africa and its political reckoning with political change at risk you know and and he marked that the the the, the truth commission was never kind of established to <clears throat> to engage with anything other than political violence and political transition and I think that was an important point because he He's, he, he alluded very early on to the limitations that the South African Truth Commission presented. 
So with, you know, with these kinds of very reductive roles that were ascribed and apportioned out, um, and that had to do with political violence, <coughs> and which both invisibilized and normalized structural and systemic violence, and structural racism as a, an integral part of how systemic violence plays out in South Africa and in post-apartheid South Africa, um, was an avoidance of engaging the question of complicity. Um, complicity as with its moral messiness, its multiple modalities that include the agency of individual subjects in its direct forms, but also that extend beyond the individual subject to include indirect systemic and structural implicatedness. And this is new work that's coming um, from a very well-known um, North American-based scholar of genocide, Mike, Michael Rothberg. Um, and I think it's really important because he's, um, he's, asking, he's asking me, at least how I read him, is to think about the slippery place between individual agency and indirect and structural implicatedness. Um, why it's important in South Africa is because the perpetrators, it kind of gave, you know, there was a picture of the baddies who led us, who got their hands dirty and let us, and I, we can talk about which us I'm alluding to here, uh, could sleep at night. And their violence was easy to identify and to name, to morally admonish, um, and to kind of displace self-introspection onto this skewed condemnations of actions taken by those who police the system. And I think that did contribute to some degree to disconnecting the historical links between um, beneficiaries and complicity and structural inequality and violence that, um, that doesn't just persist as a question of the post-apartheid. It's been reconfigured in the post-apartheid because <coughs> With the erasure of intellectual and political traditions of resistance, but not only of resistance, of imagining other forms of being human, of being, of cohabiting, of freedom, um, when that is erased, it's almost as if the alternative seems like what we have. Not that there were other alternatives, and that part of those alternatives were being debated, contested, and put forward by different um, parts of the anti-apartheid um, liberation movement, uh, which of which the ANC is a hugely important part, but not only, right? Um, and then, finally, I, and this is a point I, I, I want to put on, <coughs> on, on the table. Do I have a, two minutes? Yes. Um, and I think for people who were at the film screening and in our discussion last night, we'll, we'll get why. But the question of an ethical obligation to engage the experience and the remains of mass forced displacement, of forced removals, um, was set aside. And forced removals, to my understanding and to my own everyday engagement with living in the city of Cape Town, although that plays out in every single city you would live in or, um, or, or, or step onto as a visitor to um, South Africa, um, is that these are, they, they constitute the matrix of the post-apartheid, of our human, social, spatial, and economic geographies. Um, and so, you know, between, just from 1960, this is n not even kind of between 1913 and 1960, but just from 1960 to the mid-1980s, more than three and a half million people were forcibly removed by a state-administered project of m organized mass displacement. And um, Laureen Platsky and Cheryl Walker and uh, who, who, who were researchers in the Surplus Peoples Project in the, in the 1980s, wrote that that was, in their estimate, um, the biggest modern forced uh, state mass displacement that hadn't been um, conducted during times of hot war, right? 
So, and there's no discussion of that. There's no discussion of the right of return as an ethical question. Not, I mean, reparation and restitution, these are huge and, and important issues. Um, they're political issues. I'm not saying as a political question. The right of return as an ethical and moral question, as something that to, to, to kind of hold on to in one's conscious um, mind through everyday encounters in, um, in, in, in the little itineraries of my own small life. Uh, there is no space that has not been marked by forced removals. And so in our avoidance, or in the avoidance to raise these questions that relate to how we think about ourselves as human beings who inhabit the same geopolitical territory, but utterly disjunctural life worlds, there's a, by not speaking this, I think there's, we, there's a contribution to, I, I'm struggling to find a pronoun, I contribute to thickening the spatial and um, social erasures and silences that persist in public discourse and in the social architecture. Um, at a time when these questions are refusing to be ignored, people are refusing to have these questions. I mean, South Africans, people who have lived the experience every and continue to live the experience that Yazo spoke about, um, are refusing to let these questions be deferred any longer. And therefore, they cannot remain unaddressed. Or, yeah, so I'll stop there and um, ask John to take us to the next moment of yeah, engagement. Thank you. So before we fold everybody into the, into the conversation, I just wanted to follow up with a question or two. Uh, there are so many insights that, uh, of interest in both of your presentations. Maybe I could ask a question of you, Heidi, and then have Yasu respond to your remarks. Uh, and that is, uh, both of you have discussed in various ways how while, while those of us studying in Western universities like UM tend to uh, regard the TRC process as a kind of political, maybe even a moral and certainly a legal watershed in South Africa, that there are all kinds of ways in which the same structures, political, economic, social, racial and otherwise, that created the problems and the abuses in the first place continue after that, uh, after that institution closes its doors. And you started your conversation historically as people who were engaged in that process and, and as a conceptual point of departure, uh, I'd like to use it as well. Thinking about, are there things looking back that you think realistically could have been done as part of the TRC process that would have begun to address some of these questions? The silenced voices that both you and Yasir spoke about. Um, obviously a TRC can't cure all of the socioeconomic grievances of the society. Uh, but are there things that, that, that you look back on that is a learning experience for those of us who look back at, at mm. some of the oh, That's a great question. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I think that it could have been a much more effective tool for beneficiary communities to begin to, to become aware that there are normative ways of being in the world that require unlearning. Not to start, even begin unlearning, that's a lifelong journey, but to become <coughs> some, somewhere, and I, I'm interested to hear what Yasser has to say, somewhere in that process, I don't think that beneficiary communities who've been raised white realized that the gift of equal citizenship was bequeathed on us, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. That, that, I mean, that realization could be a moment, could, could bring a profound humility, profound gratitude, and some way a kind of very clumsy because, you know, the process of unlearning privilege and I, I hate, sorry, I hate that word privilege. No, I don't hate it. I just dislike it. Um, <laughs> Supremacist ways of, <laughs> of, of, of being in the world, um, which of course well, means that unlearn, uh, becoming aware that there's something to unlearn is going to come with failure, mistakes, that's part of the course. But to, 
some kind of pedagogic process that would have enabled those communities, the communities that I grew up in, to register that everything wasn't found, that everything wasn't just fine. That, that, that let's not speak about that and let's move on is actually a profoundly, if, you know, if middle class psychotherapy refuses that <laughs> as a healthy human response to the things that trouble, then surely kind of one should extrapolate that into a, a more kind of a, a collective, an assumption that that would work for a collective. Um, I don't think that there was a way in which beneficiary classes also got to name and speak their fear for themselves. I, I mean, I, I know I'm, I think I'm speaking quite um, in an abstract, maybe in a slightly, um, what's the word, cryptic way. And I also don't think beneficiaries should be a, put into the center of the story. I mean, I think there's a much more complex relational relational tensions that need to be fleshed out in that. But I do think, uh, you know, that is a, a, a worry that in other contexts when, I mean, I think about other contexts where that question will be raised. How do you, how does a society, how does a, a kind of institutional process bring many more people on board to not necessarily to beat oneself morally, but to have that little insight that there's a gift here. There's an act of profound generosity that's been offered by, by people that you have been socialized to dehumanize. What, just think of that as a question. So just be humble to that as a question. That is a huge question. And I, that didn't happen. And that's, yeah. And how to do that is, um, that's a whole, you know, research project or whole team research project on itself. I think as both as um, as response and engagement, not only to your question, John, but also to Haiti's response. It is very important when in addressing these questions to disambiguate and understand the meaning of the concept of anger. Because in popular discourse, oftentimes, these conceptions or these conceptualizations are very simplistically conflated. And especially when there are very narrow narrative arguments in terms of settlement and peace processes uh, that lead one to a very quick acknowledgement of a small part of the devastation that such systems cause and then allowing for a moving away from a very quick uh, distancing from what it means to be morally and dialogically responsible in the context of a constitutional framework that guarantees humanity and human rights for all. And, um, and when I say for all, I mean for all. Yeah. <coughs> Not simply narratives which say for all, but only guarantee it for a few. And I'm So, at the same time, distinguishing temporarily at the level of mapping the time frames, the multiple time frames of a conflict historically, uh, as well as understanding that in each 
and disparate, each disparate temporal frame, the moral responsibility of each of us as citizens shift. So in the context of the apartheid war, and I want to call it that, yeah. both <coughs> legally as well as socially, because oftentimes it's conflicted and collapsed. Yeah. The, I think the war that Haiti speaks of in terms of the displacement point is a social war of devastation that those of us who live in Ann Arbor know very well. You just think of Detroit, for example, that brings up some of the principles, but it can no way be compared in the same way that I'm speaking. Uh, where one just has to be to drive through across the highways and to see trees growing through through houses to understand that there is a consequence of social devastation here. Yeah. It might not have been uh, legally articulated uh, and enforced in, that, in the same way that the party displaced several generations of too many families, including my own. So when I come into this conversation of complicity and in anger, it's, it's from a very different place. And so when I engaged, and when we, myself and Haley engaged intellectually at, at the beginning of this conversation, it was a charged conversation. And we had to learn to hear each other. Because I, at that time and today, I refuse as an intellectual to accept the discourse of moving on quickly without pausing to understand the devastation that such administrative and policy frameworks. And I say administrative here, I don't mean administrative in certain organizations. Because yeah. yeah. oftentimes people confuse me when I say, when I use the language of administrative violence, that it's, you know, uh, this word that we're just administering institutions. <coughs> but the principle is linked at the, at, the, at the larger systemic sphere that these laws had to be carried out by people and defended by the executive arms of the state. And they were beneficiaries. So, understanding that apartheid was defeated is important to mark. It was defeated. It did not simply evaporate. It was defeated by many in the movement abroad, and it was defeated by many in the movement locally, as well as regionally, who committed their moral lives to its defeat. and were happy at its end, but still lived the consequences of the devastation. War is devastating. You see the pictures all around you. It is devastating. Some of us, sometimes people speak too easily about them, about war. You know, it's just be with the bad people and everything is fine. No, it's, it's much more complicated than that. Ask me, I live the legacy of war in my skin. Um, but I think this point of, of, of anger, of understanding it, you know, when, when those who are officially rendered voiceless, meaning, and what I mean by this is that there is no, there is very slight capacity to legally articulate your voice in terms of manufacturing administrative frameworks that promote and enable human rights over time. Yeah? And this is the basis of the long-term peace when when those vulnerable groups speak with uh, a vocif a vociferous, how do you, what's this word, vociferousness? You, is there such an English word as vociferous? Yeah, vociferously. <laughs> vociferously is what I'm looking for. When, when, when one articulates not only in the social movements vociferously, but it rings only as their echo. Yeah? Uh, into the social legal sphere, it produces a different traumatic anger than the traumatic anger that the beneficiary classes experience once they've lost the war because they voted and supported for that. Mm -hmm. And in South Africa, there's an act of denial and there's a pain of having lost the supremacist war, which is, you know, which for most people across the world is like, oh my God, really? <laughs> Yeah, and a, a lot of uh, students and a lot of uh, individuals here who only encounter 
South Africa has discourse, once you land, and I've spoken to many of you who've been there, once you land, you are confronted with the violence of an apartheid structure that lives and continues to live as normality, and that is a different anger. Yeah? And we were both angry when we met. I mean, I worked at the Truth Commission, although I was not very... I mean, I, I, was, I was from the, uh, you know, I come from the early movements that were ideologically saying, no, we do not want to make peace with you. But I was humbled, you know, during that process, just reading the testimonies of the families who experienced the war actively and was tired. Tired, tired, tired of this constant running, being run over by the law constantly and wanted to believe, I think, to some extent that peace and the ideal of a human rights possibility could be and wanted to have the conversation. But immediately when people say, but our land, our houses, we remove, then people from the more stronger economic sex were like, no, we don't want to talk no more. That's the past. Let's just move on together. Now, it's in this hole where the, 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 the possibility of having a difficult dialogue that ensures a mutual peace that says, yes, you are responsible and you have a responsibility to that benefit to accept this generous offer that some of the most pained and most vulnerable people were prepared to commit to in the name and the hope of a peace. Yeah. And if we look at the, you know, in the question title, which is, this, which is a broad question mark of the failure is it leaves <coughs> us with another question which is who is responsible when the most vulnerable cannot legally articulate who is responsible to curate this promise mm -hmm. is it the state when the united nations says no it's your problem now it's now a local problem uh, but it's an international crime what is the role of the international community and in our case everybody was very happy including and, and it was our fault uh, as the liberation movement to too quickly without legally enshrining responsibility to the atrocity and the atrociousness of our past to want to be included into the international community without uh, an official apology firstly and secondly, without an effective acknowledgement that goes beyond the narrow parameters of actual physical violence against the body by the arms of state, those legal and those hidden. So, yeah. Something that's fascinating about your two responses put together is that we get the, uh, we learn that this process of creating an official narrative about what happened, mm -hmm. and in particular, for lack of a better term, I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up as a sort of a, a decapitation narrative. In other words, identifying some of the most uh, the most lurid atrocities and some of those most responsible, and and in a sense, pinning a disproportionate amount of, of the blame for historical uh, abuses on a, on a relatively narrow segment of the population ends up silencing both sides again in quotes and that we have a silencing in effect of, of those who were complicit who no longer feel pressure to discuss their roles and also of course a silencing of those who, who are told that you're meant to now reconcile and that means that you're no longer supposed to according to social norms express anger in public spaces mm -hmm. but that's something of the past mm -hmm. and what I'd like to ask you guys before we open up to further discussion is have you seen a lot of change in, in, in the 20 year period in terms of civil society or academic space? Uh, is it seen as more, more legitimate, less, the same, to be able to, to, to narrate the perspectives that each of you has described? Should I? Should I? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, okay. I won't talk too much. <coughs> um, I think, I don't know who, I think we were talking last night about 20 years in the university of talking about talking about transforming. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we're good at that here. Too. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, what's really interesting is that my own perspective is so shaped by generation. 
I mean, that's becoming clearer and clearer to me. Um, in the last year in South Africa, another generation of of young intellectuals, scholars, academics, students have said enough talking about talking about transformation. Um, here's how we're going to do it. Um, we are removing statues. We're demanding the removal of statues of colonial pillagers and war criminals. And then we're going to look at a range of other things from what do we what do we study when we study humanities disciplines who teaches us why I, I work at the University of the Western Cape which is a historically black university a very interesting and complex university and very much an institutional creation of the apartheid state um, but if, if when I leave the university I look up the main highway and up on the hills of very beautiful, very wealthy, very, you know, uh, prestigious <coughs> university called University of Cape Town, which is actually where the, the student movement calling for the, you know, the beginning of transformation with the tr statues that also wasn't a, that really wasn't the end. Um, <coughs> that that university has one black South African female professor in the entire teaching faculty of the university. This is 20 years later. They've always been um, intellectuals and, and scholars. That's not new. I mean, Charlotte Matleke, who is a foundational intellectual in South African intellectual history from the early 20th century, um, studied, she was a student of W.E.B. Du Bois, <laughs> you know, she touched people's lives, she taught students, she's one of hundreds of people who were not only in South Africa, across the South African diaspora, the South African black diaspora. There's been um, <coughs> centuries of flourishing life, artistic, intellectual, creative, um, political, and yet 20 years after the end of apartheid, you know, so students are saying, well, you know, this is how we're going to do it, and we're making demands, and we're not actually, we're occupying, we're renaming, we are going to set the terms of a new agenda. And I think we have to, you know, for those who've been holding the door open for other ways, for other possibilities, it's time to say, okay, they've arrived, <laughs> and and we, we need to be, or not, I mean, it's very contested, and the role that anyone has to play in it is, is kind of seems to me, <coughs> from my experience, defined on a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on the relationships you have and the networks you, you know, how you, if I've been kind of present and working quietly in the little corners of my life, um, then those are the spaces that I can participate in. You know, it's not automatic that everywhere is my space anymore. <laughs> Um, and that's how it must be, personally. Um, academically, that, yeah, so that's in the university. Maybe I'm oversimplifying. Um, and maybe I'll just leave it at that. We can, I mean, of course there are changes. There are always changes. And a huge, huge change has been the centrality of education, you know, restating of education at the heart of the making of a kind of, you know, of, of a new citizen, at the heart of re- um, kind of open discussions and debates of what is freedom? What is a human being? How do we think about the human being when the human being in Western philosophy was shaped through the question of race? How do we unthink that? Um, you know, so yeah, I think it's, this is a long haul, but I definitely think that, um, that some of the, the slow change pace is we, we need to buckle up for some fast change. It's, it's the train left the station. I'll try and be brief because oh, I'd, sorry. Like, I'd like to you know, offer okay. you a good time to engage us as well. Um, no, I wasn't an indication of your time. I was just speaking to myself. Um, I mean, I think the, 
something that when one grows up inside of an oppressive system, especially when you live um, as the brunt of it. Yeah. Can you hear me at the back? No. That's why, that's why I've been trying to speak so loudly, but I, was, uh, I, I stopped because I thought I'm going to scare people. <laughs> um, so I can, I'll just project again. Okay. It wasn't you, it was someone outside speaking. No worries. Um, I was saying, as someone who has have survived, who survived apartheid, I mean, I, I consider myself a survivor, um, and not in any negative terms. In fact, I wish to, and I have, and I have done this since I've come to the United States, uh, as my own responsibility to the experience of those who are, are the most vulnerable in my country, and I'm not one of them any longer, as you can see. Then that's why I chose a polka dot tie to, to make sure that, <laughs> that, that you see that um, that you know I've come to a place where I can actually wear that publicly, and I'm off that. Okay, that's perhaps a joke. <laughs> um, otherwise, I'm too serious. That, but what's not a joke is that it's true. I've had to overcome the meaning of surviving apartheid as an intellectual and as a human being, and. Not many people have been that lucky. Um, and so it's important to recognize that both the ideal of, of human rights and democracy, as well as the systematic creation and construction of atrocity, takes place over time. It doesn't just occur and it doesn't just end, which is some of the, which is some of the fallacies of the dominant narratives that try to move on too quickly without addressing what people are living with after these systems end. And this is what the only thing that I want to say next is that it's, it's so important to mark the fact that this system that dogged us for so long and so many generations contributed their intellectual and their physical bodies to its ending, ended. It's, you know, I don't just want to complain about its legacy, but it's important to mark that it, that it ended. Yeah? Because if we don't mark that it ended, it's easy to forget all of those who contributed to its end. Yeah? And it's this legacy that's at risk as well. And too many people, and I don't want to be one of them, say that there's no difference any longer you know, between apartheid and post-apartheid. And that's not true. Yeah? And it's, it's easy for that to be articulated and to become public resonance uh, through a beneficiary and a second order experience. But when you've actually lived it, um, you can't articulate that. And I was, there was a, I'll tell a very quick story of an, of, 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 uh, an activist intellectual who never went to school and died when she was 60, in her mid-60s, not too long ago, um, in one of the townships outside, outside of Cape Town, Langa, and she was asked this question, what is the difference? And I was sitting there listening to her and was humbled. I mean, I was humbled. And I, I'm, not, I'm not always humble. Um, <laughs> and she said, when someone asked her, Actually, the person articulated that it's the same now than it was then. And she was an activist as a, as a teenager, a 13-year-old, running pamphlets in the 1950s. Uh, and <coughs> hopefully my math works out here. Um, and she said that, for me, you cannot compare the two. No. I'm suffering economically now. I'm experiencing a worse pain, even. 15, 20 years later uh, than I did at that time because then at least we held each other together. Um, but the police, and there will be no white person again that will walk on, and she pointed to the street because we were in a sort of a ramshackle space when we were having this conversation, and she pointed out and you could see the pavement, but there was no pavement. 
And in the in the brochure that you have, you, I mean, this articulates the extremities of Cape Town, for example, if you look at the picture that's <coughs> divided. And she pointed to the pavement and said, no one will just push me off that pavement again and get away with it and think that it's okay. And, she, and it was in this metaphor that she articulated, you know, this, the, the memory of the difference. And I think it's important to remember that. And too many people, including myself at the time, you know, Forgot, yeah, forgot, and so yes, the change is immense, immense. But for peace to be <coughs> legally articulated in the long run, there needs to be more. In terms of the law, in terms of the policy frame, because apartheid colonized not only our land, yeah, but colonized our hearts, our minds, our central nervous system, it wrote itself uh, as uh, into our blood. And I, I see similar things here, but in different ways in the US, um, so I'm not saying we, we are unique. Um, it wrote itself into our blood, and another, another person, and I'll finish, said uh, to me, and she wrote a very interesting paper on this recently, and I, I'm just blanking on her name, although I know it very well. Um, and she said, you know, when she was explaining the, tr the post apartheid trauma, she said, uh, there's, a, there's a saying in Kosara, Kosara, I'm going to struggle to ever click that correctly, but um, <laughs> she said, Segazin, you know, uh, meaning that it's, it's, it's in the blood. Yeah, the pain, the trauma, the experience, it's lived. And if we as intellectuals and activists and professionals do not hold those who are legally responsible for creating difference and the ideal of change, we do not, do not hold them responsible both locally as well as internationally, this type of pain and trauma will endure despite the enormity of the, of the change. I'm from South Africa. Uh, I'm going to try and ask, ask my question. Um, my name is Vangile. I'll try and ask my question um, in the context of education. Uh, basic education, what's called basic education and higher education. I was born in the Estate Cape, as I understand it. But, uh, it's a cross. Uh, it's a yeah. um, I was born in the Estate Cape, uh, but I had to move to Joanne. South of Johannesburg to Orange Farming Township so that it access better education. And now we're at the University of Pretoria. Um, and those spaces <coughs> are so different. Uh, and I have memories of those spaces and I continue to struggle for those spaces. My question is this memory uh, and recovery, or what can be recovered, individually, collectively, alongside. Um, state narratives about what possibly state narratives and also power players uh, and their contributions to what can be or must be recovered. Uh, yeah. Alongside that, the dignity, the dignity of the people that experienced um, apartheid and forgiveness, and I'm, and I'm deliberately listing those in that order, memory recovery. Um, dignity and forgiveness. Um, well, of course, then there are the material realities of all of this. Um, in education, how, how do we practically do this work? When you say there's this, this erasure, and I, I think in, in many ways the, the silencing, but also there's a, a sanitizing um, going on. How, how, how do you work with this? With young people that I work, I'm, I'm writing my ethnography on a, a township in Mamelodi. And every day I have to walk in there and I'm confronted by this. But now I'm occupying these multiple spaces. How do you deal with it? How do you talk to young people? How practically? I'm working in a high school, I have to confront this. I teach at a historically African university. How, how do you deal with this practically? This, this messiness. Mm -hmm because we acknowledge it ended and the legacy, but we also need to think about where we're going. Mm. 
Do you have a preference who replies? Yeah. Um, I'll be very honest. There is no answer. It's going to act as a silver bullet when it comes to this issue. Firstly, when I say there is no answer, it doesn't mean that <coughs> there should not be multiple answers. I think the answer is in the multiplicity of our response and the, the openness uh, to allow for such a multiplicity, which I think is the problem generally uh, after the apartheid system fell. <coughs> um, firstly, at its, at its larger instance. The second issue here is to understand that, I mean, and I think based on what you said, it's clear that you, you know, you, you know this. I'm not, I'm not uh, acting as an expert on this issue uh, in terms of your question, but Until the education system and those education professionals, intellectuals and practitioners during the apartheid moment are apprehended, politically and legally, they will be, it will, and I think uh, it's easier to say that now than it was 20 years ago, there will be a very difficult accounting for the centrality of the education system in creating an impart not only a party mentality, uh, but one, educating those of us who are not supposed to be legally treated as equally human to live out our lives as uh, secondary and third class human beings, <coughs> uh, and then to educate at the same time those who were supposed to be the beneficiaries, you know, of this uh, <coughs> of such a eugenicist paradigm, um, to then, as, norm as normality, live out their supremacy uh, with dignity. Yeah. I mean, I, I I live and teach in the United States because I cannot live and teach there. I was kicked out of the university, kicked out, for example. I'm an earlier generation. Uh, my graduate work was in the late 90s, so from the earlier generations of, of people who went into higher education. I got kicked out. We fought in such a way, and I was too immature at the time to understand the consequences of me wanting as a, and I continue to self-identify uh, in black consciousness terms uh, as black. Yeah, uh, as I did then and I do now. And I do not accept the narrow pigeonholing of what, what the meaning of my skin color. I will not carry my skin color and I will not walk my skin color in any context here or there as burden. And the consequence of that is me, which is a good consequence in this case, yeah, now teaching at the University of Michigan. I consider myself a self-imposed intellectual exile. And I don't say that easily because I come from, I was exiled when I was 15 in the mid-1980s as part of the 1985 uprising uh, as well. So exile is not new to me. <coughs> um, but I, I, do be, I do think um, that uh, until it is, it, it is, it is uh, dealt with at its very root, either one of these context, concepts, we will continue to then build these systems around it that fail, and I understand its failure. Uh, and I don't know if many of you that are years apartheid had 17 to 18 different education systems at the bottom at its base. Yeah, we were divided in very narrow and very very disruptive ways, and that uh, legacy continues to be lived in the minds and the hearts of too many people. Um, and so it's very difficult to articulate. And so, I, I mean, I, I, again, I conclude there is no simple answer, but we have to engage it on our terms. Those of you in, this, in your generation, uh, those of us in my generation, uh, us, you know, every generation, you know, as we begin <coughs> to inhabit the intellectual spheres in such ways that our thinking has the possibility of becoming social reality.
can, I can only reflect, um, Bangile, thank you for your question. I, I don't have an answer, but I, if I can reflect on a kind of person, like anecdote from uh, um, Well, by sheer synchronicity, today on Facebook, a friend posted a PDF. Um, I don't know if it's a book or a long article, but um, by Ibita Butter from <coughs> um, an intellectual, anti-apartheid intellectual from a very different kind of political tradition than the Congress movement, um, with an interest in uh, in education, and it's a, an article called, and if I, I can send it to you, uh, it's called Education for Barbarism, and it's a critique, and, and, and it looks almost, I haven't read it, but it looks looks almost prophetic like it's almost a, if this you know if there's certain ki kinds of archaeologies and architectures that persist in institutions beyond 94 and I, and education is one of them and no amount of technocratic kind of like immaculate technocracy <laughs> or bureaucracy or policy and Right, making more data, more information, um, you know, kind of like precisely defining your target group and target population. N none of that kind of policy language can actually undo the, the deep kind of matrix of the system. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not an educator in the <coughs> train sense. I work in the university, I work in a very particular university, it's also where I got my PhD. Um, so, and I, I say that because I thought, because of who I am, if I got a PhD, if I studied for a PhD at a historically black university, I would kind of have, you know, that I, I wouldn't be punished for that. That didn't turn out quite true. I, you know, I have a devalued, I mean, the, the way in which white supremacy works isn't only person by person. It's systemic. I don't have a doctorate from a former white, so-called white university, and there's a certain kind of, you know, I have to work harder then. Um, you know, and that's really interesting, because that was a shock. It was like, oh, okay, it works like that. <laughs> um, but work, you know, my experience is that, um, I mean, the center I work at, we started a critical education project. And the argument is that community arts projects were really central to nourishing the creative, intellectual, political life of people um, in areas that were not allowed, or, so that were prohibited from the infrastructure and resources to develop those parts of the human being. That characterizes all human life. And there was this flourishing community arts a movement in the 1980s, actually Yasser introduced me to one in particular when we first met in the late 90s. And subsequently and through kind of coincidence, um, the center where I work has established uh, a critical arts education center, not on the community arts model, because after 94, anything that has the word community and usually means developmental, and it usually means somehow bereft of that intangible, alchemistic, magic stuff that happens when you put people together and let them think freely, and without imposing how they should think because they're poor, how they should think because they're in a community. I mean, sorry if that's being too harsh, and I don't mean to, um, to offend anyone who does development work or community work, but there's a way in which something of the magic of encounter, when you put people together to think together without imposing a program on what should be thought, what should be painted, what should be imagined as a future, it just, you know, something else is, happens. And we wanted to go with the something else, the what can't yet be imagined. Let's try to do something without knowing what it's going to be and put people together. And so we've got a group of artists who are brilliant in their field. They are accomplished in their field. And we're saying, put together a set of courses and let's, you know, and, 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 and let's raise money. And we've done that and bring students from 
air, there's a school in Kailicha that's participating. There's a school in in, in Woodstock, um, Zonnebloom. That's part. There are others that are participating, and let's in, see what happens. Let's experiment. And I'm sorry, I'm taking a long time to talk, but the anecdote is about being willing to experiment. To say that maybe you know the one thing that I've learned from. Um, the anti-apartheid struggle, because I wasn't in the anti-apartheid struggle, is that people risk <coughs> imagining things that couldn't be imagined. People imagined freedom, they imagined a post-apartheid society, it doesn't look like the one we're living in, but that means it can be done again. Um, and I think there's something in the, the ways in which the arts or um, creativity or it, the classroom can become a laboratory for that. At least that's what I'm seeing. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I think it's worth risking the experiment of putting people together to reimagine something that can't yet be imagined. I don't know if that's an answer that satisfies you. Others? Yes. Thank you both for your fascinating talk. Um, so my question is for Heidi. So you, you yes, I'm sorry to pronounce your name wrong. And you spoke briefly about the contemporary, like, roads must fall, fields must fall mm -hmm. movement. And I was wondering, how does that uh, movement work to, I guess, reform your research questions? Also, you spoke about your strategies being generational. And so I was wondering, what are the tactics that are different now with the roads must fall, <coughs> which obviously is, like, action? Uh -huh. And um, and what, were the, what are the resistance strategies you are using for uh, that that encapsulates your own research questions. I guess I'm looking for the comparison. Um, mm. Also, I don't know if you have even possibly thought about this, but the collaboration with like the Rose Must Fall with other, I guess, social media resistance like um, Black Lives Matter in Palestine and their like mm. transnational virtual spaces of resistance. Mm. And so how do you conceptualize this in your research, if you do at all? I don't, I don't research. Um, I, I don't, I don't do any research on it. Um, I, I'm, I kind of comment as a citizen, um, so it's not a, a re like an object or focus or area of research. I think um, I, for one, feel that it's an emergent, it's a beginning process. It's very, very, it's uneven from campus to campus. The issues are different from campus to campus. I mean. Um, Working class, black and rural black students coming to a historically black university have very different kind of demands, although that isn't to say that there aren't starving students on other campuses, they are. There's also um, the question, I know at our campus there's a huge question. I'm, the, the whole funding structure is set to work against dignity, against um, against conditions that make studying possible. They, I mean, the lowest possible common denominator is what even the national loan scheme is based on. It's not to kind of create conditions for thinking, um, or for, for reading, for asking questions, for debating, for having a full belly and setting about like exploring the, um, this incredible gift of three or four years where you can, yes, you have to, you know, do your studies and get your grades and the all kinds of pressures that people have, but to also indulge curiosity, it's an opportunity. There isn't space given for that um, in a lot of universities, so I think it's, it's a very uneven. Um, the politics, the party politics are very complicated and uneven, playing out differently from space to space. Um, and university administrations responding differently from place to place. So um, that being said, I, I think students are also defining the kinds of alliances that they wanting from supportive faculty, and that differs from space from from place to place. Um, <coughs> and lastly, yeah, I'm just kind of not reaching any conclusions. I'm just showing up to work. University uh, work was closed for two months last year. Our university, uh, we go back to exams next week, exams that weren't finished, and I, 
really don't think we're going to start off the year with a regular registration because fees must fall is also, mm -hmm. you know, demanding no registration. Um, so I, I know, I think, I imagine Yazir has a very different take on your question. I don't know if you want to. I think there's the, the important aspects you're raising that I'm not <coughs> engaging with, but partly it's, I um, was very immersed. I mean, John knows before, before I came with, you know, the immediacy of the, pro, of, of the fees must fall. So I haven't had time and space to reflect on it now. Yeah. I, I'd like to, with your permission. Yes, of course. Yeah? Because I know the question wasn't directed at me. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot to be said, so I, don't, I won't say it too much. Two important points for me as, is in terms of the, the two movements in South Africa that you, that you mentioned, these are, these are contemporary, very recent, Articulations in a in a very in a, in a, an important space, but it's very narrow. Classically, firstly, it's an important recognition, um, and they and these movements have managed to articulate themselves outside of some of the more narrow ideological blinders of some of the other movements that have not disappeared. And you know also exists, you know, um, in South Africa. Um, firstly, uh, and it's important to, to that that anybody thinking through these questions remember that successful movements that come to articulate themselves in the body politic of the law usually uh, are transgenerational. They've been there for a long time, and they've learned from the defeats and the successes of, <coughs> of, uh, of previous iterations of such movements. And it's important, um, you know, and, and, and I know this, what I'm going to say now might not sound politically nice, but I'm going to say it nonetheless because I think uh, I would be, it would be irresponsible of me as an intellectual not to. Um, and if you're here, you're welcome to have a longer conversation outside of the space. Um, is that, and, and, and I was guilty of this. <coughs> it's the only reason why I'm saying this now, um, as a 16-year-old. Yeah. Um, as part of the uh, early iterations of the student movements of that time, um, under apartheid. Is that sometimes, as young people, we want to think of ourselves as always the first iteration. And when there's a transgenerational gap between previous iterations, I know Heidi was having a conversation with someone earlier on W. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington and, and, and other uh, intellectuals of the African American liberation year. Um, but when young people start articulating themselves as the first iteration without, uh, and sometimes I understand why that is done. Yeah? Because we had to tell our parents in 1985, no, we will not accept this any longer. And we were at high school at that time. Now, I didn't finish high school, I actually, it's always a funny thing at parties when people talk about going to high school, and I said, I never went to high school. Um, so, because at that time, our central organizing slogan was liberation before education. First we will liberate ourselves and then we will create the structures. But that was also not complicated enough because we learned during that time that once you liberate yourself from this process, the building of the education structures is, is, is continuous and simultaneous. You cannot wait. There's no simple uh, articulation of the past, present and future. We are building at the same time as we are moving in a sense. So. These organizations, you know, if they, if, they, if they do not find an intellectual ability, and I get tired of people who want to dismiss thinking, yeah? All must do is act. No, if you can't act without thinking, you can't think what you're going to do, you're going to act in the ways that have failed. Uh, and so it's important intellectually as leaders of these movements to think about that and to begin to understand that 
the issues as articulated are humane issues and others may be experiencing similar issues differently. And that conversation has to happen if larger movements are to cohere successfully. Yeah, but if one movement imposes its issue as the main issue and starts stepping on other <coughs> issues, you are doing the work of imperialism. Yeah, and it is hard to have a conversation dialogically to say, oh my God, you've got this issue, I've got this issue. How do we put it together so that we can think creatively, we can envision together and walk shoulder to shoulder, not as allies, but in solidarity with one another. Yeah, to a larger human appeal and ideal of humanity, a hope. Yeah, now these organizations, if they cannot build hope together, they will fail together, is my opinion, based on studying them and having lived through them. But it's a longer conversation, it's a simplistic answer. Thank you. I think we're, we're just about run uh, out of time, but I, I hope you all join me in thanking us here, Henry. Yes. How are you doing? sure some of you have additional things you'd love to talk about, but I wanted to have that break so that I know some of you also need to get, get going. So if you want to stick around, I'm sure we